Sir, am I audible? Yes, you are. Good morning, one and everyone. I'm Mothuri Makros of Undergraduate Honours, second semester. On uh, behalf Mothuri of Mothuri Mak, please, please unmute yourself. You are muted. No, sir, I'm not muted. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, you are I not can audible. Hear. Yeah, I can hear your issues. Oh, but, I can hear uh, Okay, oh, we must start. Okay, sir. Good morning, one and everyone. I'm Motri Makosh of Undergraduate Honours, second semester, on behalf of the Postgraduate Department of English, Bakura Christian College. Welcome you all to the sixth day of its International Web Lecture Series, hosted by the Department of English, Bakura Christian College. It is my pleasure to extend a convivial welcome to the dignitaries, faculty members, research scholars, students, and one and everyone who are present on the virtual platforms, either through Google Meet Forum or over YouTube. We are honored to have among us today two eminent speakers, Dr. Shishir Kumar Chatterjee, Associate Professor, Postgraduate Department of English, Hooghly Mawson College, and Professor Nandini Bhattacharya, Professor, Department of English and Culture Studies, University of Badua. We are delighted to offer them the most hospitable welcome notes. Before I request Dr. Shishir Kumar Chatterjee sir to go ahead with his deliberation in the first session, may I request Dr. Naru Gopal Mukherjee, Reader, Department of English, Bakura Christian College, to formally introduce Chatterjee sir. Over to you Mukherjee sir. Thank you Madhurima. Thank you so much for giving me the <coughs> of introducing my elder brother, Shishibda, Dr. Shishir Kumar Chatterjee. It's really a privilege on my part to introduce him to the audience, even though Dr. Shishir Kumar Chatterjee, as such, does not need any introduction, at least uh, in this part of West Bengal. Dr. Shishir Kumar Chatterjee currently works as an associate professor, as Modhurima said, in the postgraduate department of English at Hooghly Mahosin College. He has been teaching in the government colleges of West Bengal for over three decades. His monograph entitled Philip Larkin Poetry That Builds Bridges in 2016 has earned him international recognition as a major Larkin scholar with significant mention in the Wikipedia. His first novel, The Fire Salmon, was published in 2010. More than 20 of his research papers have been published in books, including those brought out by Orion Black Swan and Cambridge Scholars Publishing House, UK, and in reputed national and international journals. He received an outstanding teacher award, Sikhar of No, from the government of West Bengal, India, in 2017. His edited volume entitled The World of Adha Shahid Ali is going to be published shortly by the State University of New York Press. USA in February 2021. A recipient of the award of the second winner in the Write India Season 3 story writing, story writing contest organized by the Times of India group, Dr. Chatterjee's, uh, Dr. Chatterjee won the award there, the award of the second winner. Dr. Chatterjee's areas of interest include Indian English fiction and post 1950s British poetry. So I am honored to introduce Dr. Sri Chatterjee to all of you. Now, over to 
over to Dr. Chatterjee to start his deliberation. Shishidda, please. Well, uh, first, uh, Narup, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to you for the kind and generous words with which you introduced me. Uh, uh, I, I don't think I deserve uh, all these good words. Uh, well, I'm, am I clearly audible? Sir, you are. Okay. And am I visible? Although I don't, yes. don't look good. Clearly. Yeah. Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I would first like to express my gratitude to the Department of English, Bankura Christian College, for giving me this opportunity to share a virtual platform with many renowned scholars, both in India and abroad. And above all, with some students uh, in many parts of West Bengal. Uh, I usually don't speak for the scholars because I am not competent enough to do that. I always speak whenever I speak, whether in the classrooms or outside the classrooms. Uh, for the students, because the students easily forgive me my lapses. Today also, I will keep chiefly the students in mind while talking on Larkin, uh, particularly with reference to the three poems, uh, which are the most popular poems of Larkin, which the students have to read as part of their syllabus. Now, what is ironical is that Larkin hated the idea of being discussed or talked about by scholars and academicians. And yet, uh, uh, well, you can see that I am talking about him and I'm discussing, I'm out to discuss him. Uh, in fact, Larkin has been most talked about and discussed among the post Second World War British poets by scholars and critics around the world. And the reason, evidently, is his immense popularity. In fact, he was uh, the most popular poet in England, uh, perhaps, uh, in, in the 20, 20th century, after T.S. Eliot. Uh, let me begin with an interesting fact. You know, 1922 is a very important year in the history of English literature, because you all know. Uh, that uh, it may be said to have officially marked the beginning of modernism with the publication of uh, three important works. One is T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, uh, the second one is uh, James Joyce's Ulysses, and the third one is uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, Jacob's Room. Now, interestingly, it is also the year in which Philip Larkin was born, as if as a part of a design in the history of English literature. Let me try to explain it briefly. Uh, you know, Larkin, uh, I would here uh, uh, like to take you back to the title that I have chosen for my talk today. It is Philip Larkin, uh, the demotic poet of religion, death, and ordinary life. Now, uh, can you see me? Hello? Can you see me? Yes, sir, very clearly. Okay. Uh, now, who is a demotic poet? This is for the students. Demos means people, public. So Larkin was a poet who wrote for the people, chiefly. Uh, he wanted that his poetry become accessible to the public, to the general public, and that they derived pleasure out of this. In fact, Larkin had an essay uh, called The Pleasure Principle. Now, why is this uh, demotic term in Larkin's style and also in the choice of his uh, subject uh, matters? Uh, here I will take you back to the history of uh, 
England, the socio-cultural, political, uh, economic, and literary history of England after the Second World War. And you will be able to relate it why I chose this kind of a title. You know, after the Second World War, Britain underwent sweeping changes in its economic and socio-political status. The Labour government, uh, which was uh, elected with an overwhelming majority in 1945, adopted a number of welfare measures. The Apley government created the welfare state. The railways, coal, gas, electricity, road transport, uh, steel industries, all these were taken into public ownership. Industry was brought under strict governmental control. Now, these measures were intended to encourage the a reconstruction of industry, which had been starved of investment uh, during the years of the Second World War, and which had suffered damage during the nightly raids by the German Air Force in the war years. Now, for obvious economic reasons, uh, uh, you, you can guess an unprecedented amount of public expenditure causing the devaluation, the welfare state declined. And the government had to fall back on the mode of reconstructing the socio-economic structure. And as the people were disillusioned, the government was Uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Hello, Dr. Chatterjee. Sir, can you hear me? Chishita, are you there? Uh, I'll give you. I'll give him a call, sir, and get this fixed. Okay. Okay. There must be some. Uh, yes, yes. Some network issues. Some network issues. Yeah, he has come back. He has come back. Okay, that's wonderful. Sisidha, have you come back? Sisidha, Dr. C.C. Chatterjee? Yes, Dr. Chatterjee, have you come back? Is he in the participants list? Yeah, he has just, I think he has just joined. Rejoined rather. No, give him a call. Okay, okay. Okay, okay sir, sir. Sorry, participants, just one or two minutes, please spare.
Uh, I, I talked to him. He's joining, sir. Okay, I'm. We are waiting. Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Uh, okay, we we are waiting, and uh, we request all the participants here to kindly wait patiently for Dr. Chatterjee. And this is always there a kind of problem with this virtual platform that may not work all the time smoothly for all of us. And that's why we feel that classroom teaching has no alternative really. Virtual platform can't really be the substitute, the alternative form of teaching, classroom teaching. This is what we realize. And particularly, uh, Dr. Sisit Kumar Chatterjee, uh, he, even yesterday, he was saying that he's not very comfortable with this platform. Anyways, uh, we request all of you kindly to wait patiently. And Dr. Chatterjee will be coming back in a short while. Yeah. Yes, I'm back. Welcome back. Yeah. yeah. There was a technical problem. Uh, Mr. Chatterjee, please. Come. Yeah. Yeah. So what I said so far, uh, I mean, during the time that I was off, uh, I would like to sum it up in a few words. Uh, because after the Second World War, England uh, was going under a period of reconstruction, so the poets of the movement, they also made it a program to attune themselves to this spirit of reconstruction by writing a kind of poetry which would not be difficult or incomprehensible, which would not be based on the mythical elusive, elusive mode which was practiced by uh, the poets from Eliot to uh, Eliot, Pound, Isherwood, uh, all these uh, poets. Uh, who, who, who broke the bridge between poetry and uh, the uh, public, the, the poetry reading public. These movement poets, therefore, began to write a kind of poetry which, was, which would be readily comprehensible and uh, would be based on the principle of pleasure. And there was another reason for them to write this kind of poetry that was, it was also, I mean, uh, 1950s, 1960s, uh, also was a period uh, which was uh, dominated by, uh, which, was, which was dominated by uh, uh, consumerism. Uh, because the people, uh, you know, they, they, they uh, you know, program their lives, ar lives around their pay packet, around the, the pub, around television programs, and around um, instant sex. And these television addicted people could be made to read poetry if they found um, any pleasure in poetry. And therefore, uh, Larkin chose this demotic style. That is why I, I have chosen this kind of a title. Larkin is the demotic poet. As Eric Hobsbawm argues, the demotic style was a convenient way of rejecting the values of parental generations, or more precisely, a language in which the young people could grope for ways of dealing with the world to which their seniors' rules and values no longer seemed relevant. So Larkin also avoided the, the uh, Eliotian uh, and the Poundian modernist experimentalist obscurantism uh, in, in poetry. Um, you know, the, the movement sensibility uh, was also uh, against not just uh, the uh, Eliot Pound Yates uh, obscurantist experimentalist style, but they were also against the poets of the 1940s. Uh, who were the new apocalypse Dadaists, uh, the surrealists like Dylan Thomas, W. R. Rogers, and Edith Sitwell. Now, their argument, I mean, the argument of the movement poets for going against the surrealists and the new apocalypse poets was that 
these poets, I mean, the poets of the 1940s, uh, led by Dylan Thomas, uh, they sort of, you know, misused or mishandled Freud's ideas about the tripartite structure of psyche uh, in order to legitimize their irresponsible uh, indulgence in a damaging randomness of poetry, uh, which was largely responsible for the rapid collapse of public taste for poetry. Now, there was another important feature. I mean, uh, the, the movement that is the 1950s uh, in England was also dominated by the philosophy of uh, WJR, the philosophy of logical positivism, uh, which was the official philosophy of the time, which emphasized empiricism, verification, and analysis. Uh, you see, A.J.R. himself said that no statement which refers to a reality transcending the limits of all possible sense experience can possibly have any literal significance. And that, I quote, the mystic, so far from producing propositions which are empirically verified, is unable to produce any intelligible propositions at all. So, in the vast majority of cases, the sentences which were produced by the movement poets, particularly Philip Larkin, uh, were uh, sentences that had literal meaning, so that the public would find uh, the satisfaction of Im immediate communication uh, with the poems. And uh, another important thing that I would like to mention um, uh, uh, that, that happened, uh, that, that shaped the background, the cultural background of the 1950s in England, was the movement of dialectical exposition. Uh, it is uh, that which elucidates its subject after the manner of a dialogue. There is statement, counter statement, and conclusion. And the primary appeal is to reason. And uh, please remember this, and you will be able to relate Larkin's style of narration in his poem, Church Going. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, there, there is, uh, I mean, this, this hostility uh, towards modernism, towards its uh, experimental uh, and, and obscure antist bias, and the, uh, uh, I mean, neuromantic excess in poetry, which resulted in a kind of randomness, led the movement poets, particularly Larkin, to invert Archibald MacLeish. You know, Archibald MacLeish wrote a famous poem called Ars Poetica. Uh, and he, he, the last line of that, of that poem was, uh, poetry must not mean, poetry must simply be. They wanted to invert it into uh, poetry must not simply be, it must mean something. And uh, Larkin said uh, a very interesting thing in his own characteristic style. If Eliot wanted the reader to be patient uh, in case uh, he found a poem, he or she found a poem obscure, the movement uh, and um, vociferously defended the right of the reader to be bored. And uh, this is how uh, Philip Larkin actually uh, wanted to rebuild the bridge between uh, poetry and the general reading public. Uh, in, in one of the uh, anthologies, Larkin said, uh, it was an anthology uh, edited by D.J. Enright, uh, another figure of the movement, uh, I quote, Larkin said, I write poems to preserve things I have seen, thought, felt, both for myself and for others. And he said, if there is no successful reading, the poem can hardly be said to exist in a practical sense at all. In fact, Larkin also claimed uh, that uh, if poetry has lost its pleasure-seeking audience, it has lost the only audience worth having. For the movement poets, the sense of an audience was 
are very important. Now, it is a different story that the movement poets themselves were divided into two groups uh, regarding the quality of the audience. For example, there were the, 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 I mean, there were some poets who were the followers of uh, F.R. Levis, who insisted, like when, that uh, uh, those who would like to enjoy poetry must first be born with the right kind of brain and later trained in the right way. Uh, and and for, for them, I mean, the, for the Levisite, uh, for the Levisite movement years, uh, uh, it, it is uh, an able, discriminating readers, uh, the minority uh, readers, intellectual readers, who must constitute the public for new poetry. But there were some other poets of the movement who were the followers of George Orwell. And they, I mean, uh, you know, Orwell, actually Orwell himself, he wanted to redeem uh, uh, poetry uh, from the clutches of the modernists and uh, he wanted the common man uh, to become more and more, uh, uh, you know, uh, pro poetry, and uh, uh, and 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 they, uh, they, there was no harm if they were uh, if they sounded arrogant and unintelligible uh, uh, while expressing their opinions about uh, the kind of poetry which was practiced by the modernists. Now, this uh, divorce between poetry and popular culture. Uh, it was uh, almost complete before the uh, Second World War. And after the Second World War, this, uh, you know, a, a kind of reconciliation had to take place between poetry and the reading public. Uh, now, it is this belief which prompted Philip Larkin to scornfully dismiss Eliot's notion of tradition. Uh, which, which he described as a common myth kitty or casual allusions in poems to other poems or poets, uh, which he finds unpleasantly like the talk of uh, literary understrappers. And uh, uh, it is this conviction which uh, you know, prompted uh, Philip Larkin to praise and admire John Bidgeman, uh, who was not actually a movement here, but who uh, wrote almost uh, during the same time. And for John Bergeman, Larkin said, the modern poetic revolution has simply not taken place. Uh, I quote, for whom there has been no symbolism, no objective correlative, no T.S. Eliot or Ezra Pound. Now, post-war uh, Britain was politically, as, as I was, uh, as I hinted at the beginning, uh, during the time perhaps uh, when I was off uh, from this site, uh, the post-war uh, Britain was politically dominated by this sway of democratic ideals, which put pressure on the poet to be socially useful. You know, the newly instituted Arts Council desired to bring the arts to the people and uh, the Arts Council called upon the writers uh, in its annual reports to reach a growing audience emerging in the new industrial areas. And in the 1950, the Council decided to pursue an active policy of encouraging poetry. So uh, the uh, movement here naturally uh, got some encouragement uh, from, from, from all sides, from the political side, from the cultural uh, side, from the economic side, uh, from the social aspect. And uh, thus, uh, they began to write a kind of poetry which was uh, easily comprehensible, easily accessible, and which would yield pleasure to uh, the readers by, uh, by, by, by being moving and memorable. And uh, uh, Larkin himself said that his poetry should be able to, to compete with television or radio. Uh, if I remember his quote correctly, he said that my poetry would take the uh, child away from the uh, television and the young man from his pub. There was one, uh, well, uh, there are two more things that I would like to say about the background and then I will uh, start uh, uh, talking about the poems. One thing is, uh, there was another important thing happened uh, in, in Larkin's case, uh, at least, 
that is he shifted his literary allegiance from yes to hardy and he said when i came to hardy i quote it was with the sense of relief that i didn't have to try and jack myself up to a concept of poetry that lay outside my own life this is perhaps what i felt yes was trying to make me do what larkin liked about hardy primarily i quote is his temperament and the way he sees life he is not a transcendental writer he is not a yes he is not an eliot his subjects are men the life of men time and the passing of time love and the fading of love now the result of uh, larkin's shift of literary allegiance from uh, yeats to hardy was that larkin turned his attention uh, outward you know if you read the poems of the north ship which was uh, published in 1945 but the poems were written before the second world war uh, i mean the poems in that collection uh, you will you will find that larkin was more more or less a self absorbed poet and he was also trying to follow uh, many other uh, poets as a uh, style and uh, you know i call this uh, in my in my thesis uh, and also in my book uh, i call this volume uh, an anthology of influences and uh, there was one last thing uh, that i would uh, like to say uh, it was uh, something biographical uh, i mean larkin's father died sydney larkin died uh some time in 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 1958 or 1959 i don't remember the exact year now sydney larkin was not just larkin's father i mean they had a wonderful literary relationship it is not that larkin's father himself wrote but larkin's father was perhaps the first reader of whatever larkin used to write and he was the constant audience for his poetry but when his father died you know he was uh, pushed to uh, a state of uh, nadir of uh, depression and he was uh, sharply reminded not not just of his own mortality but of mortality as an inelectable truth of life and his vi- vision became bleak and he wrote pervasively about uh, death and you will uh, be able to relate this when you come to ambulances and there are innumerable other poems in in larkin's four major collections of poetry which deal with the theme of death okay <clears throat> now let us <clears throat> try to relate the words that i said so far to the uh, individual poems and uh, let me assure you that i am not going to take up many poems i will take up only three poems church going first then ambulances Uh, the death poem and finally uh, the witch and weddings the poem uh, that celebrates uh, ordinary life and then uh, i mean we shall uh, be able to uh, relate why i uh, said so elaborately about the background of the movement you know one important uh, socio cultural issue of the movement was uh, uh, was the contemporary milieu in which the role of organized religion uh, was generally declined as one commentator writes i quote the church is still attracted enthusiasts and occasional bursts of fervor remained possible but generally people just neglected to think about religion and larkin registers his response to this issue in church going which is a, a much anthologized and widely admired poem uh, perhaps uh, uh, everyone in england has read this poem now what is the poem about let's see what is the what, what is the poem about now out for a bicycle ride the speaker stops at a church and goes in to look at look round on first entering the church the speaker in an expository manner uh, like the dexter stage direction in a modern play makes an assessment of the building and its contents his pose is cynical detached 
and unresponsive. Uh, as he dismissively says, okay, it's just another church. And uh, then he carefully, uh, you know, lumps together certain uh, objects that he, uh, that, that, that draw his attention, some brass and stuff up at the holy end. Uh, and then there is a description of the neglected dried up flowers the musty smell inside the church uh, and uh, all these things uh, you know reflect on the uh, almost abundant condition of the church then the speaker walks around to the font and runs his hand around it uh, he is an agnostic observer he considers the premises at first merely as a piece of architecture, idly speculating as to whether uh, the roof that looks almost new uh, has been cleaned uh, or restored. Then he mounts the lectern, reads a few hectoring large-scale verses, boyishly aping a vigorous voice and finally exits after leaving an Irish sixpence. There's a story about this Irish sixpence. I'm not going into that. Uh, so it was a kind of token donation. And still maintaining his pose uh, of an uninvolved sightseer while going out, he reflects, uh, the place was not worth stopping for. But the poem tells us and reminds the narrator that stop he did as he frequently does. Now the question is, why? Now Larkin himself told Ian Hamilton in an interview, why do you come here? Why do you bother to stop and look, look around? The empty church subtly prompts him to consider the purpose of church and religion in an agnostic, in a post post-war agnostic age. He questions not only the continuing purpose of the church he visits, but the compulsive motive that drew him there. You know, this is this question, counter question, statement, counter statement, and then perhaps he will come to a conclusion. And the remainder of the poem develops into a meditative groping for an answer. The, the first two stanzas describe an actual visit made by the speaker, that is his own church going, and the rest of the poem explores the other meanings uh, of, 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 of uh, his act of church going and also of the meanings uh, which are embedded in the layers of the title that is church going there is church going to the dogs church you know uh, uh, going to be to, to the domain of oblivion or someone's act of uh, going to, the, uh, to visit a church now, the third stanza begins these speculations with the speaker wondering what will happen when churches fall completely out of use? Wondering if we shall keep a few cathedrals chronically on show, their parchment, plate and picks in locked cases, or shall we leave them to molder as wings? Or, and just note the lyricism, quote, let the rest rent free to rain and ship. Or whether they will become haunted places, avoided as unlucky. Here the speaker's tone is uh, a bit jocular and mildly satirical. And then the fourth stanza continues this speculative vein with the speaker still wondering whether people uh, will in future avoid the then ruined church as an occult center of superstition. I quote from the poem, or after dark, will dubious women come to make their children touch a particular stone, pick simples for a cancer, or on some advised night, see walking a dead one. Power of some sort will go on in games and in riddles seemingly at 
random. But still further ignominy perhaps awaits the church, <clears throat> as Larkin speculates. The speaker is convinced that superstition, like belief, must die. And then he asks, what remains when this belief has gone? Now his answer to this question is half jocular and half serious, mixed with a mood of almost nervous apprehension. Uh, he says, I quote again from the poem, uh, uh, who, he asks, will be the last, the very last, to seek this place for what it was? One of the crew that tap and jot and know what good locks were? Some ruin beaver? Randy for antique? Or Christmas addict? Counting on a whiff? Of gown and bands and organ pipes and mire? Or will he be my representative? Bored and uninformed? The speaker's speculation about the fate of churches thus is poised between two age-old antagonistic views of life. The scientific view, in which the real is reduced to the lowest terms of objective fact, and the ideal or transcendental or supernatural view, which prompts us to look beyond the logocentric plane. Now the future is scientifically oriented and therefore there is every possibility that it would look upon churches merely as curiosities, only preserving some of its relics in a museum. Uh, and the speaker assumes that uh, religion is in decline and that we shall very soon see the last church goer to seek out the church for its original purpose. Now, here we come to the very interesting and the last section of the poem. The last two stanzas of the poem, uh, uh, in which we, we see the poet's contemptuous and ironic attitude toward the church being replaced uh, by his serious questioning. Uh, will lead us to uh, a clue to an answer uh, to this question as to uh, the church uh, will still retain its original purpose. And what will be the original purpose of the church? And the speaker hopes, firmly hopes, that there will be some who, though they are bored and uninformed, and know that the old institutionalized religion is dead, will need to come to this cross of ground through suburb scrum. For them, the church will continue to be a serious place, for it has held unspilled so long and equably what since is found only in separation, marriage and birth and death and thoughts of these, for which was built this special shell. What Larkin wants to imply here is that the church sanctions a religious authenticity to the central events of life, marriage, birth, and death. And that these are the central events of life uh, will be clear at once if you look around the world during this uh, the outbreak of this pandemic. Uh, you know, marriages are taking place, uh, although uh, the number has uh, been reduced largely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, children are being born, and and of course people are dying, and they are dying in large numbers. And the church uh, will accord to these. Uh, principal events of life a vital significance by elevating them far above the level of humdrum mundaneness. And 
that is why Larkin uh, concludes his poem thus. The church, I quote, is a serious house on serious earth it is, in whose blend air all our compulsions meet, are recognized and robed as destinies. And that much never can be obsolete, since someone will forever be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious and gravitating with it to this ground, which he once heard was proper to grow wise in, if only that so many dead lie around. So, what Larkin uh, concludes the poem by saying is that you know, uh, whatever happens, however scientifically oriented human life becomes in future, and uh, however steadily does the place of organized religion decline in the future society, the church will still retain its importance because the human life will always need uh, to, to, uh, to find the seriousness of purpose in whatever uh, it, it does, it indulges in. And whenever they will uh, need the sanctification uh, of, of the seriousness of purpose of their life, they will definitely turn to some uh, building which maybe even once upon a time in the past used to uh, represent the organized religion and doesn't do any longer. And yet the church will stand there as a building with its own significance. Now, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we, 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 we shall be there definitely to address those questions, to try and address those questions uh, at the end of my session. But now, for the time being, let us pass on to the next poem. Uh, that is ambulances. You know, uh, as I told you in the beginning, it is a death poem. And this is not the only death poem that Larkin has written. It is a good poem, of course, about death, but uh, a far better poem about death and also about life, uh, which even ambulances uh, also is, uh, is another poem, which, which is not collected in any of his anthologies. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't know when, whenever the syllabus framers uh, take up this point, they uh, most often ignore that point that is Aubad. However, our concern is not Aubad. We are concerned with ambulances. Now, this is a good point. Don't worry. Uh, you know, uh, ambulances purports to make fear palpable and to evoke it in the mind of the readers in such a way that the effect becomes uh, you know, spine chilling and the effect becomes immediate. You just look at the very title, Ambulances. Uh, whenever, uh, just imagine yourself uh, riding a motorcycle or driving a car and uh, an ambulance honking behind you. And what is the feeling uh, that, that, that is evoked in your mind? And the same feeling is evoked in the title. It is menacing, it is disturbing. The very picture of ambulances, you know, uh, has a disconcerting effect on us because they are inevitably associated with disease, illness, accident, uh, and death. Now, these are the evils that beset human life on earth. The poem begins by, uh, by presenting uh, realistic and, 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 and I should say military imagery of ambulances. Uh, right at the outset, the ambulances are shown to be impersonal and frightening reminders of, uh, of uh, an unpredictable fate of some individual or of some families uh, to whom that individual belongs. Now, these are the vehicles of death and they thread their way through the streets of a city at noon. When the city itself, now here life is, you know, uh, woven into uh, the picture of death. The city itself is buzzing with uh, the pictures of life, with the noises of traffic and with the crowds of people. 
uh, <clears throat> you know, some some women are coming back from shopping with two bags uh, uh, hanging from their two hands, and as they are coming back home, they are smelling uh, the smells which are coming from the kitchens of different houses, and the children are playing on the streets, and uh, in the midst of all these things, the ambulance is, uh, it, it, it looks like a confessional because it is closed like a confessional uh, in a church. Now onlookers uh, find themselves, whenever they look at the, uh, the ambulance, they find themselves randomly and suddenly caught up in someone else's tragedy. They stare at this vehicle apprehensively and possibly inquiringly. That is, who is it meant for? Who has it come to take away from us as the ambulance darts through the streets but cannot make out who of their neighbors it is meant for? Because the machine-driven conveyance cannot give back any answering glance to the spectators. The, the color of this vehicle is equally fearful and eerie. It is gray. Uh, in, in our place, uh, in, in West Bengal and in India, uh, it is white. And then also it becomes uh, you know, fearful because white you know, is the color uh, of the cloth which is uh, put uh, over the uh, dead body. This therefore is the color of lifelessness. Now for a while, the ambulance stops to rest at a curb and uh, then Larkin says, uh, I mean, the speaker says uh, a, a, a very interesting uh, uh, statement, I should say. He, he makes a statement that even the onlookers should not think that they are spared from the terror, that they are uh, not uh, going to be touched by this. You know, if you remember the story of uh, Yudhishthira and Yoksho, uh, in, an, in, 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 in reply to a question uh, of asked by Yaksha Yudhishthira said that what can be more surprising than this that uh, even though so many people are dying in every moment uh, we all think that we are immortal but these ambulances will not uh, allow you uh, the luxury of that illusion of immor immortality it will remind you that you too are very much mortal and uh, then uh, someone is towed into the ambulance and uh, as the body uh, is taken in, uh, most probably it is the body of someone who is ill or someone who is dead and the face, of, uh, the, the face is described as wild and white and uh, then the doors of this motor driven messenger of death are shut and uh, it starts moving away to its destination. And then the onlookers uh, and, and also the children, they express sympathy for the poor soul who is carried away by uh, the ambulance. They say poor soul. And that is what, uh, that is how you also react. And they perceive a kind of pity underlying their lives too, that after all, uh, the lives of all of us uh, are merely, I quote, uh, it, it is only a unique random blend of families and fashions. And we know uh, its ultimate end. And uh, so the ambulance drives off in dead and air. And uh, this unique blend uh, finally begins to come asunder. Uh, we, we, we know that uh, if he's dead, that, then nothing uh, of the pattern, the intricate pattern that Latin says in Ovad of life can uh, bring this man back to life. And then everyone as the ambulance disappears uh, uh, with the uh, diseased man or with the dead man, uh, the, the, the viewers uh, feel, they sense dissolving emptiness, 
Yes, that is what death is. The solving emptiness. It solves the problems uh, that beset life, but it also leads to uh, leads you to a state of emptiness. The solving emptiness that lies just under all we do, and for a second, get it whole, so permanent and blank and true. And all we are reminded of by the ambulance is the endless extinction. And uh, this thought of endless extinction keeps on flowing in our minds amidst everything that we indulge in, in life, perhaps in order to uh, avoid that thought of the inevitable. Okay, now uh, uh, it's 12.25. Uh, 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 just, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a, very, a very brief uh, summing up of the Wits and Weddings. Uh, it is a poem uh, in which uh, Latin uh, takes a train journey. Uh, uh, where, I mean, it, it, is, it is a train journey from Hull, where Larkin used to work as a librarian, to London on a witch tide Saturday. And it is a holy and auspicious day in England. And this is a day on which the uh, many people, particularly the people belonging to the, uh, belonging to the uh, lower uh, class and lower middle class, uh, they uh, get married because that is a day on which the uh, the the what should I say you know the the surcharge of the tax or uh, you know something is imposed on marriage registration fees something like that that is lessened so the uh, poor people they uh, avail this opportunity and uh, as Larkin has uh, uh, got into the train he initially he finds the train. Uh, empty and then at every station that the train stops uh, he uh, sees that uh, one or two marriage parties are getting into them and uh, when he looks at the platform uh, he says that uh, many people who had come to accompany the uh, wedded uh, couples uh, they were behaving in peculiar ways and uh, if I had time I could have uh, you know uh, described uh, the way Larkin has described the behavior of those people, of the mothers, the fathers, the uncles, the, the sisters, uh, the, the fashionable uh, young girls, and how the confetti is thrown on the wedded couples. And uh, initially, you know, Larkin was feeling uh, annoyed and bored by this uh, din and bustle inside the train compartment. Uh, uh, created or caused by this uh, married couple, but then gradually he begins to take interest in these people. And uh, when he does not quite know, he also becomes a co-passenger with them. And ultimately, you know, he uh, he just uh, believes that when this train uh, reaches London the wedded couples will scatter through the London with immense possibilities of uh, scattering new lives like packs of wheat. And uh, uh, so here, uh, and the, the, the last part of the poem here, this is, there is a very interesting image in the last part, which is an image of regeneration, uh, uh, where you have, you have uh, rains, and rain, you know, rain means water, and water is not only a symbol of purification, but it is also uh, something, uh, an elemental presence, which is used in all our rituals. And uh, and and uh, water is, is is something which is also associated with uh, rebirth, with, with with baptism, with rebirth, and all these things. Okay. And uh, Larkin was very serious about the last two lines of the poem, uh, where he uses the image of the uh, rain uh, falling uh, like a shooting arrow shower, because uh, he attached, he wanted to attach 
a uh, very uh, serious importance to this image as it would uh, sum up his positive vision of life uh, and and particularly this positive vision which is derived from uh, his observing the the uh, humdrum uh, lives uh, of the uh, ordinary people of the common people and that is why you know there is a book on larkin larkin has been described in that book it is most probably written by lolet kubi it is uh, philip larkin uh, an extraordinary poet for the ordinary men i'm sorry it's it's, it's a, an uncommon poet for the common men okay so this was it is 12:30 on and i think i should uh, stop now now if you have any uh, any question uh any question from the audience i would like to take it up thank you sir for facilitating such a positive learning environment by your amazing lecture now may i request professor oyan mondol sir assistant professor and head department of english bakura christian college to conduct the interactive session over to you mondol sir uh thank you bodurima for giving me that opportunity Uh, I cannot thank uh, Dr. Chatterjee enough for that uh, extremely lucid, comprehensive, uh, student-friendly yet scholarly lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, it's time for interaction. I already have some questions posted in the chat box. I'm reading them to you, so one of one by one. Uh, okay. The first question comes from Shubhrato Moody. He he asks, uh, "Church is a symbol of man's sincere search for the ultimate meaning of life." Does Larkin want to establish this idea through his poem "Charge Going"? Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, the to mean the church is not the, according to Larkin, at least it is not the uh, primary symbol of the significance of life. You know, Larkin actually wanted to. find out a sign for the the uh, several stuff that he found inside but then in he as a poet wanted to probe deeper intellectually into the question of human existence human existence in relation to the church building the church will no longer be existing in the future world as as a symbol of institutionalized religion but the the inevitable urge for seriousness the hunger for seriousness in man uh, to to endow uh, his own existence with a kind of seriousness will always be there and it is here that the role of the church will keep in now for the, the next question or thank you sir uh shudhi sundar you please reframe your question and uh, put it after a while i'm reading a question by omrita botobal i would like to request sir to tell something about latin strong affinity to lawrence and freud evident in the poems annus mirabilis and this be the verse if sir can afford that time of course sir okay. can sure 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 i can i can afford the time no problem uh, but the problem is you see uh this is not the problem of uh, the persons who have asked this question this is a general problem a logocentric problem uh, i mean particularly those who have been uh, uh, who have been sort of brought up uh, uh, in the atmosphere of english literature studying english literature whenever we hear the word sex in poems like annas mirabilis or say and you know more in i mean apparently more grossly in high windows we think of lawrence and we think of freud but in larkin's case that is uh, you know not the point let me tell you one thing in uh, you know 1960s uh, uh, britain saw the uh, encroachment of a permissive society many laws associated with uh, sex with 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 marriage with uh, divorce with uh, you know extra marital affairs many laws were either relaxed or repealed and uh, because it was also uh, the time when the plebeian culture the popular culture infused into the fabric of british 
society you know s- certain certain you know taboo words like fuck for example uh, intruded uh, or crept into the english uh, or at least into the vocabulary of english poetry particularly in the poetry of philip larkin and you know not only the word sex if you read for example the poem sunny pristatin uh, i think uh, you will you will begin to hate larkin unless unless you go to the uh, end of the poem uh, uh, or uh, let me tell you uh, let me quote uh, a few lines the, the first few lines from uh, high windows it it begins thus when i see a couple of kids and guess he's fucking hard and she is taking pills or using diaphragms i know this is paradise now let me tell you this is not a poem about sex it's a poem about liberation from the logocentric network of this world it's a poem about transcendentalism so larkin and, and in fact there are many words there are many taboo words used in the whole range of larkin's oeuvre and you know i had to uh, i had to buy uh, a dictionary of the british slang in order to read larkin's poetry it's still there with me ntc's dictionary of uh, british slang so there are many slang words i mean what we call slang words uh, although the original meaning of the word slang is slightly different and there are many you know there are many uh, obscene words uh, many taboo words and the, the the use of these words has got nothing to do with lorenz or with freud in fact he as i if you remember i told you in the beginning maybe you could not hear it because uh, i was off uh, for, for some technical reasons for some time i told you that larkin was dead against the surrealist and the apocalypse because they misused freud's discovery of the tripartite structure of the human psyche by indulging in a damaging randomness of poetry which was responsible for the breaking down of the bridge between poetry and reading public so the word the use of the word uh, say anas merabilis for example yes uh, it begins with this uh, sexual intercourse began in 1963 though it was too late for me between the end of the chatterley ban and the beatles first lp now if you go to the end of the poem the very last line of the poem will uh, give you what the poem is actually about that sex does not give us liberation whatever you get from life is a gain it's an incalculable gain and the very last line of last two lines of the poem i only used those two lines uh, in an article on corona virus the other day uh, let me quote those two lines and if you if you uh, look beyond logocentrism and if you think of ordinary life if you think of the way the ordinary people derive pleasure out of the small things of life then you will feel that life is uh, a brilliant breaking of the ban a quite unlosable game okay now the next question is wonderful sir uh, the next question comes from devopriya guha sir larkin basically discusses about Achha, or, or on just or yeah. on just one thing or on just one thing yes sir uh, you see i i have no problems in answering all the questions but uh, think about nondidindi no she is going to Sir, I have I have talked to Professor Bhattacharya. Uh, he Achha. she will join once the interactive session is over. We will give her a call. She will wait. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She will wait. Okay. I have talked to her, sir. Okay, I feel so honored. Okay. Uh, our, our students are <laughs> eagerly waiting for the answers. So okay, then then no problem. No problem. Happens, no problem. No problem. No problem. I I, 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 I I have time for all the questions if I can answer them. Yes. <laughs> now, the next question, <laughs> please. Yes. yes. as uh, so larkin basically discusses about death illness accident etc as in evidences and other poems and uh, devopriya also talks about uh, charge going where larkin is describing about uh, the abundant condition in future so her question is can larkin be labeled as a pessimistic poet sir okay my my first answer is uh, uh, devopriya and those who have uh, asked this question about larkin's becoming a pessimistic poet look you were in great company because you were not the first people to uh, to uh, describe larkin as a pessimistic poet uh, you know uh, the the first one who vociferously argued uh, that larkin was a pessimistic poet was semasheni right 
Same as Heaney has a book called The Redress of Poetry. And in that book, Heaney, uh, uh, Heaney described Latin as a pessimistic poet by comparing him uh, with Yeats. And uh, if, you, if you have had time to read, I have an article. And the title of that article is The Positive Latin, a rejoinder to Semas Heaney. I have refuted all the charges, all the charges labeled against uh, Philip Larkin, uh, particularly his pessimism by Semas Heaney. Larkin was not a pessimistic poet. If you read, uh, uh, let me mention the titles of the poems. If you read even Aubard, which is uh, which I believe is the best death poem in the agnostic uh, post-Second World War uh, period. Even in that poem, Larkin talks about, uh, towards the end of the uh, poem, Larkin talks about the wonderful network, human civilization, and the doctors and postmen. You see, postmen, like doctors, go from door to door. Postmen are the symbols Postmen are the symbols of uh, communication, right? And doctors are the symbol of healing, of fighting against not just coronavirus, but all kinds of viruses, all kinds of diseases, all kinds of illnesses. Now, uh, there are many other poems, for example, the building, there are a bit uh, bigger poems and that's why perhaps uh, people don't include them in the syllabus. Uh, uh, there are poems like, uh, like At Grass, there are poems like, uh, uh, you read The Wits and Weddings, uh, there are poems like, uh, uh, like Show Saturday, which is a wonderful poem, the poems in which he has expressed his sympathy for the old men, uh, like uh, The Old Fools. Uh, and, uh, and, and and there are there are uh, innumerable other poems even towards the end of his uh, career when he almost officially stopped writing poetry the way he expresses his sympathy for the life of uh, of, of of a small creature uh, uh, which uh, which was jammed against the wheels of his wheelbarrow uh, of his mower uh, of his lawn mower uh, will will tell you how very empathetic Larkin was uh, towards life and how positive was his approach to life. Yes, of course, there are some pessimistic things. There is no denying that fact. But let me tell you one thing that, I mean, uh, perhaps this is a quote from Terry Eagleton or uh, maybe Sigmund Freud. I don't know. Uh, I, I just heard it uh, only yesterday from my son, uh, uh, who is sleeping now. Okay, uh, the quote is wonderful. He said, and uh, only those people can afford to be pessimistic who love life most intensely. Okay, and Larkin himself said, even to write a pessimistic poem uh, itself is a very positive act. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think that answered a good number of questions already in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not reading those questions. Okay. I, I will take, uh, if you can take, sir, two more questions. One of is course, from, of course, no problem. One is from Dr. Shuranjana Bhadro, your student. Uh, and oh, also oh, sure. <laughs> she asks, okay. in Larkin's poem, we find him as a detached observer. Yes. But he is very much present in all these activities. Why mm -hmm. does he maintain such physical alienation? That's a question, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, well, Suranjana, let me tell you, I'm sorry, and, uh, uh, in this physical uh, distancing has got nothing to do with coronavirus, right? And <laughs> no, no, uh, the thing is, uh, uh, Suranjana and Ayan and all those who are listening, you know, the reason has to be traced to Larkin's biography. Larkin lived a very monastic kind of life. He had, uh, uh, what should I say, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, embarrassment whenever he had to face a large gathering. He had about six, I mean, half a dozen of love affairs, but he could not, uh, uh, you know, turn any of them uh, into fruition. And he said, you know, uh, uh, talking to a woman, 
or having sex with a woman is as difficult as standing for parliament right and uh, uh, even in hall where he used to work as a librarian he used to go there uh, he was the first to uh, go uh, to the library and he was the he used to be the last to leave the library and all the time he used to remain confined in his uh, chamber and he used to keep on reading books and uh, this uh, kind of a monastic temperament uh, this kind of an uh, of, of an introvert uh, personality a monastic temperament uh, you know perhaps initially adopt uh, you know led him to adopt a kind of uh, detachment towards his subjects but then in almost all the poems he does as uh, you have uh, perhaps already suggested in your question shurunjana he does uh, integrate himself with the common stream the common network the common web of humanity okay thank you sir i think onto radhi onto radhi has something to ask yes sir thank you thank you so much for this illuminating talk as usual uh, as you were talking about the background and you mentioned john betjeman uh, it just to feel like it for me to know whether uh, somehow this this railway and the electric railway perhaps uh, had it anything to do with the the thought of this train ride in which and wedding because uh, uh, benjamin's poem the metropolitan railway does mm-hmm. talk about a couple who felt so sure on their electric trip that you yes, 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 of course of course Back of course you. and antara uh, thank you thank you th- thank you so much for reminding me of this i mean uh, this will be a part uh, of, of 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 my answer to the question that was asked about latin specialism you know uh, the thing is uh, you know uh, john bidjeman uh, does have a poem uh, it was uh, the metropolitan railway in which he describes a couple right and uh, uh, in in that poem he he says john uh, john bidjeman says uh, that i mean that that is that is a tragic statement that he makes that john bidjeman makes that is uh, um, uh, can you remind me of that line that famous line uh, uh, the i mean she died of she died yeah. of cancer and yeah. he died of yes that that, yeah. that kind of a thing so yeah. um, and then you know cancer was a very dreadful disease uh, yeah. uh, at that time it is still a very dreadful disease uh, but some cancers are curable nowadays at that time cancer was not uh, curable at all in fact yeah. lakins Larkin's father died of cancer. Larkin himself died of cancer, and uh, Aga Shahid Ali, on whom I worked, uh, yeah. um, uh, he died of his mother died of cancer. He himself died of brain cancer. So that can, the reference to cancer, uh, cancer it reflects yes, heart yeah. is killing her. Right, But right, right. heart is killing her exactly. Yeah. Heart, yeah, cancer has killed him. Heart is killing her. Yeah. It's a wonderful, you know, you know see, it, it's a wonderful lyric also. Uh, and 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 this yeah. one line you know captures the whole tragedy perhaps of the civilization right and uh, now in larkin strange journey uh, he does not in in larkin strange journey in larkin strange journey uh, in all the journey poems there are many poems uh, for example the best poem of uh, of strange journey i i should say is not this one the wills and weddings but here here which ends with the the theme that this journey is not simply a journey from hall to london or from london to hall but it is a journey beyond the here it is a journey to uh, somewhere else and you know the importance of uh, of, of somewhere else and in fact latin has latin has a poem uh, of, of that title uh, mm-hmm. the importance of elsewhere okay and this yeah. strange journey takes us to that that that, that elsewhere and this uh, journey to the elsewhere uh, became possible because the railway and the 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 bus traffic also the railway the rail journey the bus journey they were also in see the fares were reduced largely if you relate if you go to the background um, as, as a as a measure of the welfare state the fares uh for particularly for the uh, lower middle class people 
and the uh, the the middle middle class people the fares were largely uh, lessened the fares were largely reduced and that uh, uh, you know gave birth to a number of journey poems particularly the poems in which train journey takes place right mm -hmm. yes sir thank you okay. so much sir Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, just one last question because I find yeah, it sure. very sure, sure. interesting and relevant. Uh, this okay. is asked by Devjita Guho. Achha. She asks, would you please explain how far Latin style can be considered as surrounding of Yetchian moment within a Hardyesque frame? That's her question. Uh, well, I, I have not got the question properly. Sh uh, shall I rephrase the question? I, I think she wants to know about uh, Larkin's influences. You know uh, whether he oh, was. Oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Okay. I know. Yes, well, yes. well, uh, she is Dev Jita or uh, what is her Dev Jita Guho. Dev Jita. Dev Jita Guho. Okay. Okay. Dev Jita Guho. Uh, this is for you. Uh, okay. I I I told you that Larkin. After the publication of the less deceit, or I mean, the, uh, from the very uh, time in which he began to write the poems that were that are included in the less deceit, <laughs> Larkin had already by that time uh, shifted his literary allegiance from Yeats to Hardy, and not only from Yeats, he had shifted his. In, in fact, a, uh, you know, T. S. Eliot also, although he was uh, uh, terribly anti-Eliotian. But T. S. Eliot also exerted his influence on Larkin. Even Dylan Thomas, there is a poem uh, called "Dry Point." There is a poem, poem called "Dry Point." If you read that poem, you will clearly see that this. And, and if I omit the name of the poet, you will say, and if I ask you, or you guess the name of the poet, and you will definitely say, this is Dylan Thomas. So he was against these poets, but but uh, these poets had also influenced him to a great extent. And now this shifting of this uh, uh, literary uh, influence from Yeats to Hardy, uh, you know, shaped Larkin's style. In the North Sheep poems, Larkin's style was, uh, you know, uh, it, it was a kind of inward moving, inward directed. But uh, in the uh, uh, poems of the uh, less deceived, the Wits and Weddings, the High Windows. And the poems that were written after the publication of these three major volumes, uh, Larkin's style has become very demotic. He begins to speak in a uh, different language, and he implicitly expresses his gratitude to Hardy for shaping his style, molding his style in this way. Because uh, if you remember the quote I, I uh, read out from Larkin, that is, when I came to Hardy. Uh, I did not have to worry about the fact that I could not write about anything, and I could not write about uh, these things in my way. So he wanted to write in his own way. For example, I'll, I'll give you just one example. There is a poem called "Money." Okay, money, money, right? Taka. There is a poem called "Money." Now, in that poem, uh, you see, Larkin says, you know. Uh, Money is isn't that important in life. Yes, you need some money, but uh, uh, however um, uh, much money you, uh, you you save in your banks, money won't buy you more than a shave. And uh, in, in England, the dead bodies are shaved before they are buried uh, in Christianity. So uh, money won't buy you more than a shave. And then in the middle of the poem, he says, you know, but what to do? I have to earn money because. I have, uh, you know, this is the speaker of the poem is a middle class, uh, maybe a clerk, and the speaker says, uh, uh, "But you know, uh, there is uh, there are Myra's folks. Myra is his wife, the speaker's wife, and Myra's folks. He doesn't say my in-laws. He says Myra's folks. That is Myra Lokrachi, and then he makes the money sign. He uses this language. Can you see me? He makes the money sign in this way. Makes the money sign." Right. So this money sign is a gesture, and he captures it in his language. Right. So uh, Hardy's influence had uh, largely shaped uh, Larkin's style and made it, uh, and and went a long way to make it demotic. Okay, Oyan. Now, any more question? Thank you so much, sir. Over to my colleague. Uh... Moshumi Kundu, Faculty Department of English, Bangladesh. Okay, may I? Okay. Uh, I am. I am. 
just me oh yes sir may i ask uh, a question to or, or i think it's time i uh, know uh, ma'am is here sir so yes it's already one it's already one it's all right all right all right now no okay. problem i have no problem but i i, I can't keep nobody the waiting you know <laughs> i shouldn't touch okay thank you thank you okay over over to motion me please is am i audible sir yeah yeah of course you are thank you sir dr chatterjee for such an insightful thought provoking and engaging lecture we acknowledge with due respect your support and solidarity with our initiative to help the students and the researchers as well in accepting our invitation and delivering such a wonderful lecture that makes us think and motivates us to learn further thank you sir thank you so okay, much thank you so much yeah thank you so much now okay uh, now we will proceed towards the next session and uh, now may i invite madhuri ma to start the next session madhuri ma thank thank you uh, am i audible you are yes. audible madhuri ma go ahead uh, thank you ma'am our second speaker in today's session is professor nandini bhattacharya professor in the department of english and culture studies university of badwan before i request ma'am to go ahead with her deliberation in the second session may i request professor shibajyoti parmukar sir assistant professor department of english bakura christian college to formally introduce professor bhattacharya ma'am over to you parmukar sir thank you madhuri ma'am I am really honored to introduce Professor Nandini Bhattacharya, Professor of English, Department of English and Culture Studies, the University of Baduan. Before joining the University of Baduan, Professor Bhattacharya served different different government colleges of West Bengal and University of Hyderabad as an associate professor, and later at West Bengal State University, Barasa. Professor Bhattacharya. is an accomplished scholar in the areas of feminist theory uh, post colonial studies transnational and feminist discourses she is widely published both nationally and internationally she is a persuasive speaker with a gifted ability to present complex themes in clear and easily comprehensible ways professor bhattacharya has exceptional history of leadership serving as an academic department chair the director of a large doctoral program and a founder of many important interdisciplinary working groups she has been invited as a professor of professor and head of department of english and culture studies and dean school of language is the central university of jammu from 2014 to 2016 she has also held the prestigious post of chairperson of spors which is a committee for women rights and sexual harassment central university of jammu jammu and kashmir professor bhattacharya has been a visiting fellow of university of south florida and state university of new jersey university in 2006 in india she has been a visiting fellow of the department of english with the sagar university medinipur in 2011 in the department of english delhi university and in sambalpur university sambalpur odisha in 2014 she has authored co-authored many books and wrote a number of articles in national and international reputed journals to name a few rk narayan's the guide new critical idioms from world view publishers in 2004 a love song to our mongrel selves Problematics of identity in the novels of Salman Rushdie in 2005, Muluk Rai Khan's Untouchable in 2006, narratives of Frenchy, Sarath Chandra Chattopadhyay, and the Colonial Encounter in 2007, and many more. We are really honored to have such a dignitary as a speaker in our international public series. Today, Professor Bhattacharya will talk on reading houses. in jane austen's novels and i am sure that her lecture will provide us 
with illuminating insights not only for the students but also for the research scholars and for all the faculty members now may i request professor nomini bhattacharya madam to go ahead with her deliberation ma'am please thank you for a very kind introduction and uh, i believe that i i am i am most beholden to the department and especially to the head uh, and oyon because they have been in contact with me but all the members of the department who are making these contact programs possible and who are making students feel less lonely you see so you know it's very important for that this communion is happening this communion between students and teachers who are divided by the corona virus and divided by contagion the, that this department of bakura christian college has organized these webinars is one way of such uh, communion that is going to happen between us or is happening between us who are older versions of you all and our um, students i mean who are younger versions of us so it it is in this context and in no other uh, great uh, you know uh, sense of hierarchy that i would like to present my thoughts on jane austen's uh, mansfield park in particular but the uh, anthropomorphizing of houses in uh, a late 18th early 19th century literature i have uh, presented a a ppt uh, which would sort of help you all but uh, just to state that the you know if you have seen a recent movie on prime called gulabo sitaro then you would have sort of understood or maybe seen an older movie called garam hawa you would have possibly understood the question of anthropomorphizing houses that is making houses human all right so uh, giving a house certain qualities now in the uh, 18th and in the 19th centuries great country houses came up and these great country houses were also built around great parks and 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 avenues and water bodies and all this was beautifully curated because uh, it is it is the conjoining of art and nature that was the ideal that would be presented now uh, you see when we are talking about such houses we have to understand that houses stand for something houses are not uh, you know brick and mortar but houses stand for something very very important which is why i would ask you to go to prime uh, at amazon prime and see gulabo sitaro where in the end the character of amitabh bachchan he said i mean when he's asked by bakke as to why that old lady married him he said it was or why he married that old lady he said that it was because of the haveli it was because of the house so houses have their own attraction houses have their own uh, qualities as it were now when we are talking about the 18th century when we are talking about the uh, late 18th early 19th century and these great country houses we must be reminded of the sources of money for the building of these houses all right now what what were the sources now most of these country houses if you see my ppt which i on my put it up uh, uh, is abhinav mondal are you there abhinav mondal yeah please begin presentation yes, yes. madam is it visible yes if you if you see the ppt then you will find that i have included a uh, a chhora a little sort of you know rhymed uh, 
piece by Jonathan Swift, which talks about this connection between plantations, between slavery and the great houses of the uh, 18th centuries. So uh, that is something I think is very, very important. I mean, the great houses were built on the money that was accrued from the plantations, especially the sugar plantations in the Caribbeans, in places like Barbados, in places like Antigua, and in other islands as well. Now, the brutality of a plantation uh, and the brutality of slavery in these plantations is you know, contrasted with the order and the beauty of the great houses of the 18th century. Now, I mean, in fact, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's something that you will have to pay attention to that the house is actually produced by the money that was accrued through this cruelty, through the perpetration of uh, this uh, cruelty and this uh, practice of slavery in or deploying of slave labor in these uh, plantations. Now, the deploying of slave labor in plantations, remember, uh, continued even though uh, uh, technically there was an abolition of slavery in 18. 33. Now, usually Mansfield Park is read in conjunction with this declaration of abolition of slavery post uh, Edward Said's reading of Mansfield Park in Culture and Imperialism. However, we will come to that a little later, but simply say that the romantic movement that you read about the talk about nature that you are, you know, enjoying to write in your exam papers when you are asked about romanticism and nature or uh, the features of romanticism owe a great deal to monies that were coming, monies that were coming from these plantations and colonies. And it is these monies which went on to curate nature. So the natural description of the Y Valley, W-Y-E, or the descriptions of the ruins of the Tintern Monastery, the Tintern Abbey, these are all, you know, part of memoirs of people who went on to tour these great houses, these great monasteries at a moment of great building, you know, a surge of monument and house building, monastery building. And uh, these monies came from the various plantations and colonies. So, you know, I'm making a point that uh, I'm making a fairly acute point that when one is talking about or when one is reading about nature in a, a romantic poetry, one ought to look at nature not in the raw, not as it is presented in Hardy, for example, not something ferocious, not something, uh, you know, uh, unbounded, but nature that has been curated, nature that has been uh, controlled, nature that has been subdued, and which has been made into beautiful parks, beautiful uh, avenues and so on and so forth. And mostly, this is a kind of nature that accompanies a house. So I think this would enthuse you to go back to your, you know, answer to uh, romanticism and adding nature as a feature of that romantic movement uh, in a little more textured and dense way and understand that this fascination with nature and especially fascination with a garden space is has a certain material basis. That means that the nature was, I mean, which Wordsworth is admiring is not just there or the nature that Keats is admiring in to one who has long been in city paint is just not there, but has been created through human effort 
and a lot of landscape uh, makers, you know, and architects whose money comes from these plantations and plantations in which slaves live in terrible conditions. You see, they are packed together like animals in barracks. So you can look at some of the tea plantations in our own country and some of the pictures that are provided and you will have a fair understanding of the inhuman or the bestial way in which the slaves which produce this money are kept. And it is this money that goes on to produce that beauty, that order of nature that you appreciate in romantic poetry and in romantic novels like Mansfield Park. Now, when one is talking about Mansfield Park, I mean, uh, one has to remember that Jane Austen, uh, this is the only novel of Jane Austen in which which she named, which she named after a place, after a house. I mean, Northanger Abbey was actually named by her brother. It wasn't named by herself because Northanger Abbey was published after Jane Austen's death. Therefore, we have to give a little importance to this act of naming. I mean, why is uh, uh, this uh, named as Mansfield Park? That is important. I mean, the house is the character. And when we are talking about Mansfield Park, we are also talking about the Portsmouth House, which is put as its other, which is put as its contrast. And after Fanny has come back, after having lived in Mansfield Park for some time, she finds the Portsmouth House to be confined, smelly, dirty, and most uh, unesthetic, you know? It's almost as if one is comparing the barracks of the slaves to the, uh, to the beautiful houses and nature of, uh, of 18th century England or early 19th century England. Mansfield Park, I think, was published in 1814. So, but it refers to the, uh, you know, the, the great surge of house building and estate building in the 18th century, you know, from, uh, you know, the beginning of the 18th century. But as I mentioned in 1833, technically, the, uh, the, uh, there was an abolition of slavery. Now, Mansfield Park takes its name from Lord Mansfield, who had given a great judgment, a great ruling with regard to a slave called Somerset and who had said that he had his rights as a man and as a human being and could not be forced back into plantation. Now, let me give this very simply, you know, uh, he, uh, the uh, chattel slave is someone who does not have any human rights. Now, today, when we are talking about Black Lives Matter, when we are mourning the death of uh, Floyd's, uh, you know, killing by a police officer, we have to look back to this whole idea of whether a black life matters at all. You know, and uh, this slave Somerset, who was a house servant in England, who had, uh, you know, whose master wanted to push him back to a plantation. And this is something which he did not want to do. And so he registered a case. Now, this itself is, you know, phenomenal because, I mean, if you are registering a case against your master, it means that you have a contract with your master and not just and you are not his property i mean a property cannot say that i am not going to do so and so suppose you own a table lamp all right the table lamp can't go to the court and say i'm not going to stay in this corner of the room i want to stay in another corner of the room the table lamp doesn't have a say whereas a you know therefore this ruling or judgment is very very important and the fact that Somerset was given such a ruling by Lord Mansfield, and there are, there are other reasons as to why Lord Mansfield was 
sympathetic towards the person of color. That is another story which we can do another day. But this was a historic judgment. So in all probability, Jane Austen used the name of uh, Mansfield as a sort of directive. You see, so when you are going to read Mansfield Park, you remember the connection between the great houses of uh, the 18th and 19th centuries and their connection to chattel slavery, their connection to plantations, their connections to the ways in which money from the colonies and especially from plantations were brought in to England to augment its nature. Now, what is the meaning of the word augment its nature? This means that nature is not enough. I mean, nature has to be curated. Nature has to be controlled. Nature has to be given a direction. Otherwise, nature is vicious. I mean, something Hobbesian, okay? nasty, brutish. So one can't talk about nature in the Romantic period in a sort of, you know, uncritical way. One has to be a little more attentive to the reasons, to the historical reasons as to why Romanticism is associated with nature. So this is as much a lecture on for the students who are assembled on the idea of nature in Romanticism or Romanticism as uh, engaging with nature as it is on the anthropomorphizing or making human of houses in the 18th century. I mean, they are connected just as a uh, house is uh, made human. So also nature is made human. All right. And it is this process of making nature human. It is a process of control. It is a process of constant pruning, constant controlling of uh, you know, vegetation and other things, the, the unruly aspects of nature. So uh, uh, quickly, um, uh, when, uh, when we look at the house of Matthew's Park, we have to go on to also look at the plantation in Antigua that is producing the money. Now, Lord, uh, the, the, uh, the owner of Mansfield Park is Lord Bertram, Thomas Bertram. He is what you could call a sugar baron. All right. Now, a sugar baron is someone who makes his money on sugar. All right. Just like the Ambani's are called polyester princes because the Ambani's made money on polyester. So they are sugar barons and there were many sugar barons because most of the money of English gentlemen came either from cotton or from sugar. All right. There also a lot of money did come from people who had been administrators and who were sort of, you know, fed on large amount of graft, goose in the colonies like India. So they were also called the nabobs. So, so three kinds of uh, money, I think. One from plantation, tea, coffee, sugar, one uh, and cotton, and uh, one from graft and other kinds of money uh, from the colonies in administrative positions. These were the two major, uh, you know, borrowlooks, the, the rich people in, in, in the uh, in, in 18th century England. That is when the high tide of colonialism had, you know, had struck. So simply, I mean, this, these are the points that I want to make. Number one, that, uh, that the process of colonization has to be linked to the writing of these great 18th century, early 19th century novels that, uh, you know, the obsession with nature is not something sudden, transcendental and free flowing, but connected to the materiality of England's money coming from these plantations. And this is again an interesting thing that in the plantations, and this includes the tea plantations of Assam, nature is seen as something that has to be uh, extracted, you know, that has to be exploited. It's a very utilitarian approach to nature. 
whereas within England, the approach to nature is that it produces beauty and uh, aesthetic feelings. So nature is good in itself. I mean, when one is reading Wordsworth, one is talking of nature as something that will lead you to God. So nature is something that is divine. But within the um, uh, colonies, nature is described as garden and as wasteland. Wasteland are the places which must be utilized. So a plantation is basically a wasteland concept because it is there that you utilize the land to maximum. Neel chash bolo, um, coffee producing, uh, sugar producing, cotton producing, these are, you know, cash crops. These are high yielding. These have a lot of, these required a lot of water. And these destroy the land because, you know, you are exploiting the land without giving it even a certain fallow period, without allowing it to recover. You are trying to extract the maximum from a piece of land. And also when you are inhabiting the slaves, you are also pushing them into little rooms within barracks and you are trying to extract the maximum from their bodies. But when you, this money comes into England, then there is a transformative uh, you know, dimension. So nature becomes beauty, nature becomes divine and uh, the 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 uh, houses become also uh, you know they stand for the beauty of human beings they stand for the dignity of human beings so what i'm trying to say is that dignity of nature and dignity of the great houses of the 18th 19th centuries are produced by the indignity of the indignity of nature and indignity of human beings in the uh, margins, in the colonies. It is by, uh, you know, instrumentalizing, please note this word, it is by utilizing, it is by instrumentalizing a human being and instrumentalizing nature that one can produce the uh, beauty and aesthetics of nature and human beings in the uh, in the metropolis. Now, what is the meaning of this word instrumentalize? I mean, this is a Kantian idea that when you are meeting another human being, you must give that human being dignity. That is that human being is priceless. You see, it is beyond any price. It, your relation with a human being is not transactional. Similarly, Wordsworth and Keats and Coleridge appear to say that your relation with nature is non-transactional. You are, you know, nature is good in itself, all right? And in fact, it can be a passage to divinity, even if you don't believe that nature itself is divine, all right? Whereas in the colonies, nature is seen as something that has to be instrumentalized. In other words, it does not have any innate dignity, but is simply like maybe a maybe a pen, I mean, which you use and throw. All right. You don't do that to your friend, do you? I mean, you with your friend, you uh, you are friends for life. I mean, you don't depend on a friend for his or her use. Amar bondhu, amar kon kaji ashve. That is not bondhutto. Whereas a pen is not as good as you can use it. You can throw it away. So this is the difference between nature and houses in the Romantic period. While in the metropolis, the house and the nature that surrounds the house or maybe is part of the house is, uh, is you know, is dignified in itself. And when one studies romantic poetry or romantic literature, one has to take into account the material basis of such beauty. The fact that such beauty and dignity is produced by the, uh, you know, the uh, utilitarian approach to land and to labor in the colonies.
Now, um, I think I don't have too much time left, is it? Ayun? Madam, go ahead. Please. No problem okay. with time. Okay, so uh, you know, with uh, the uh, with Mansfield Park, let me sort of quickly go over Mansfield Park. In Mansfield Park, there are two houses. In fact, there are three houses. All right, the houses from which the Crawfords come. But nevertheless, uh, in Mansfield Park, you have two kinds of. Uh, I mean. Quickly, uh, there is a little girl called Fanny Price who arrives from Portsmouth to Mansfield Park because she is the daughter of, uh, uh, you know, Mrs. Price, who is the sister of the lady of uh, Mansfield Park and, uh, uh, you know, the, the wife of Mr. Bertram, the wife of Lord Bertram. So basically, Fanny is, uh, I mean, Mrs. Bertram or Lady Bertram is Fanny's aunt. She's sister to Mrs. Price. Now, obviously, the two houses are different. The two houses, one is smelly and crowded. And Mr. Price has been a silly man. He has also produced many children. This is in contrast to the Mansfield Park house where there is dignity and order, there are two sons and two daughters. So even in the production of children, there is an order. And when Fanny uh, comes there, initially she feels very, very small. She's made to feel very small by Miss Norris, but uh, who is another of her aunts. But later on, she makes her own place in this house and she becomes the future mistress of the house given that you know it is she who is responsible it is she who is quiet and it is she unlike uh, lady bertram who takes charge of things in the house there is a transformative moment when uh, the crawfords and the uh, the Bartram siblings want to produce a play, which is a little risk, R-I-S-Q-U-E, which is a little, you know, maybe not fit for young children. And uh, so that is something Fanny refuses to participate in. So here again, I talk about the anthropomorphizing of the house, the house and its dignity, the house and its respectability are as important as the dignity of Lord Bertram. Lord Bertram has gone off to the Caribbeans to quell a revolt, a slave revolt in a sugar plantation. And that is when these children seem to take over. But Fanny is the only child who refuses to participate in this. And when Lord Bertram comes back, he breaks down all the props and theatrical accruements and he is, uh, you know, he rewards Fanny for her, uh, you know, quiet dignity as it were. Now, uh, finally, there are, uh, there is uh, one thing I'd like to say and then I would like to invite a few questions because uh, it's already quite late and I'm sure people are hungry. That is, there have been two approaches to the reading of Mansfield Park, which is only one among the many romantic novels and romantic literature about buildings, all right? Like Tintern Abbey, that portion of Tintern Abbey, Tintern Abbey itself is part of a larger poem, is about buildings. All right, so I would like my students to be a little more conscious about the, uh, you know, the building within nature, not nature as in uh, rock stones and trees, but also nature as a built structure which protects nature or gives nature its uh, a pivot, as it were. The house is at the center of a park. So, you know, the house, as it were, holds together the natural beauty. So there is a uh, design behind all of this. Now, uh, two kinds of, um, two kinds of uh, approaches. One, an older one by Edward Said, in which he compares uh, the crushing 
of the revolt in the Antigua sugar plantations by Lord Thomas Bertram to his crushing of the revolt within Mansfield Park and uh, his, uh, you know, bringing back the house to order. But there has been a revisionist approach in which one shows the close connections between Jane Austen and her affinity towards Lord Mansfield and his family and affinity towards Mansfield's great judgment about the rights of a slave. I come back again to what is very contemporary, that Black Lives Matter. Why must one still preface the word life with Black Lives Matter? Because obviously they don't matter. Okay, that is that is why we are still talking about Black Lives Matter. So instead of all lives matter. So black makes a black reminds you of this history of slavery and this history of instrumentalizing a human body. Now within England, this is the new, uh, you know, the new theses that are coming up that Jane Austen was actually pro abolition. She was not anti-abolition. I mean, she was, she celebrated Mansfield's judgment and, uh, the, you know, because Norris is a Dustu Lok in Dustu Mohila in this novel, Norris was also the name of one of the lawyers who had fought against abolition. So all these show that Jane Austen was pro-abolition and that Mansfield Park is about, it celebrates the abolitionist uh, thing, the abolitionist policy. Now, this schizophrenia, you see, obviously, this is something that is difficult to uh, work out through a reading of Mansfield Park. But this schizophrenia is interesting, because Britain continued to support slavery in places other than its own uh, you know, geographical borders. So within England, slavery was abolished. But in the plantations, in other places, slavery continued. It was later replaced by indentured labor, but within England, you know, and its laws of liberty and human equality, the question of the slave trade was abolished because it, uh, you know, it made a human being into an instrument. So the fact that Fanny becomes a self, Fanny becomes a person by herself, also shows the coming out of a slave as it were. I mean, uh, Fanny's own position was little better than a slave when she had come in. So this schizophrenia is a healthy schizophrenia. You know, so I'm, there are two approaches. One that this is an anti-abolitionist novel, and two, that it is a pro-abolitionist novel. Now, I am I don't mind this either or because I find both to be in dialogue and both to be a productive place to read Mansfield Park and to read romantic literature as engaged in houses and nature and nature in houses. Thank you. for such an enthralling, insightful, and thought-provoking lecture. Now, may I again request Professor Oyan Mundal Sa, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of English, to Bakura Christian College, to conduct the interactive session. Uh, thank uh, you, Udrima, for once again giving me this chance. Uh, Madam, I have a question in the chat box. Can I ask them directly? Yes, yes, please, please. please. Uh, it's from Tathavato Bosch. Uh, mm -hmm. He asks, Jane Austen's novels have been popular for over 200 years, despite mm -hmm. the fact that the world she lived in no longer exists. Mm -hmm. Life tragedies in particular has been repeatedly adapted for plays and movies. Mm -hmm. Why is Austen's novel still so popular with people mm -hmm. returning to the story and adapting it mm -hmm. in different cultures and times? Mm -hmm. Yes, though this has really nothing to do with my lecture, nevertheless, Jane Austen, I think, is popular because Jane Austen has a narrative. And, uh, you know, South Asians are very fond of narratives. I mean, it is this uh, 
beginning that contributes to a middle and a middle that contributes to an end you know it is this narratival structure of jane austen that gives us a peculiar pleasure because a narrative gives us a sense of order a sen sense of uh, you know that uh, all wrongs will be righted therefore it is this uh, narratival depth or pivot of jane austen's novels which give it a, a enduring value i mean people like or love stories and jane austen has solid stories and solid stories which are interspersed with relational complexities now this though i am doing a bit of stereotyping i still believe that south asians are family oriented and they love stories with which have relational complexities and which have a beginning that contributes to the middle that contributes to the end thank you madam the next question is from a faculty member of a college mitra chandigrahi uh, she yes. asked us do you feel madam there has been some sort of an evolution in terms of anthropomorphizing houses from the romantic times to the victorian times for example if we talk about miss habisham's house in the mm -hmm. credit expectation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is a good question this is a good question and i will have to think about it you see by the time uh, one is talking about victorian houses england is a settled power and therefore there is a tendency to uh, taxidermize as it were you know to sort of uh, uh, congeal into some sort of a hoary old thing such houses and if you remember that miss havisham herself is taxidermized she is an old woman who wants to protect an old moment when she wanted to get married and when she was jilted so taxidermy is the art of uh, preserving something that is dead so yes if you are talking about an evolution then i think this is an interesting point that while houses are more living and vibrant elements in the 18th century by the end of the 19th there begins a fetishizing of these houses and making them into objects which are you know which uh, whose vitality is gone but which is still preserved you know as if it is still vital as if it is still real so good thank point you, thank you madam uh, this was a question probably by a student tonmoy dash madam mm -hmm. what's not austen criticizing the idea of improving nature through fanny price when fanny mm -hmm. expressed that she would rather see uh, southern in its original beauty than improved by mr rasworth yes i mean uh, you see again uh, southern is the other house in uh, uh in the novel but uh, i would you know contest this idea i mean there isn't any yes or no in this i mean you i i, I agree i mean you stick to your point but my idea would be my contention would be that fanny is part of the improvement you see when she comes into uh, mansfield park mansfield park is almost entirely being run by mrs norris i mean and there is an absentee uh, the uh, you know ha house owner the uh, uh, thomas bartram has to run off to london for various parliamentary duties and lady bartram is a lazy irresponsible woman therefore the house lacks a center the house lacks a moral center why is fanny treated so badly in the beginning i mean had lord bartram had his way then there would be justice and dignity given to this little girl who is actually related to them and who has been brought here on an act of charity if one looks at the etymology of the word charity it doesn't mean throwing a bone at a dog it means love unconditional love so where is that justice where is that love in uh, mansfield park at the beginning of the novel at the end of the novel when fanny is being married off to the younger 
son of the Bertrams, there is a definite indication that the moral center of Mansfield Park will now shift from Lord and definitely Lady Bertram to Fanny Price, because uh, who will become Fanny Bertram, because she is the one who is responsible and she is the one who will protect this house from moral misdemeanors. Obviously, the enacting of the lover's vows, had it gone through, would have meant a infraction of the dignity of that house. So therefore, I stick to my idea that uh, Fanny is, uh, is introduced in Mansfield Park as a part of its improvement plan. Fanny is the best thing that happens to Mansfield Park because she is quiet in her own way and she can blend with Mansfield Park. She's not overwhelming like the Crawfords. She comes from a poor family and therefore she can be its gatekeeper as it were. You know, you know a gatekeeper, someone one can't see but who is vital for the maintenance of that house. And yes, Devjita, uh, yes, uh, I think, has a question. Yes, yes, Devjita has a question. Ma'am, yes. can Mansfield Park be read from the point of view of fairy tale motive, as Fanny, an orphan, at the end becomes the mistress of the true, house? True, we true. Say that the house is working a tool here. True. I mean, of course, see, when one is talking about uh, the novel as a genre, and one is going back to Ian Watts, the rise of the novel, there is a great emphasis on rupture, that the novel is, you know, is unprecedented. Is uh, It's something that had never happened before, and the novel is very real. That is, realism is the base word of novel. The novel was there because uh, there was a need for bourgeois realism. And the bourgeoisie wanted the novel because they wanted realism. Now, this is an idea that is has been undercut by theorists such as scholars such as Michael McKeon and a little earlier, I think, not the Fry. They talk about the novel structure as devolutionary rather than evolutionary. What is evolution? That there is something that is stunted and small and putative, and then it becomes something that is full and great. All right, unlike such a view, if you talk of the novel as not evolving from certain inferior forms, such as the fairy tale or the romance, but you look at the novel as in conversation with earlier forms and as utilizing those forms in or contemporanizing those forms, I think it will make more sense. All right. So, of course, the fairy tale, the romance is a very important part of novel writing. And I would ask uh, the question uh, maker to also go on to read uh, Jane Eyre which is a classic fairy tale of a Cinderella girl, Cinderella kind of figure. So is Mansfield Park. Mansfield Park adopts the, uh, you know, unquestioningly adopts the plot of Cinderella. The poor young girl who goes on to marry a prince and occupy a great house. Yes, thank you for the question. Thank you, Marilyn. This is the last question. We are already testing your patience. Uh, no, there, no, no. there is a pattern of binary presentation of houses, both in Pride and Prejudice, uh, mm -hmm. for example, Bennett Houses, Pemberley Houses, and Watering Heights, Watering mm -hmm. Heights itself, and Thrush Cross Ground. It yes. is part of the text being belonging to two different historical periods. Mm -hmm. There is also Thornfield Hall in Jane Eyre, standing mm -hmm. as an anthropomorphic house, a set mm -hmm. of schizophrenic tribes. Your, mm. your, your take on this one. Yes, I think this is a good question and I would have spoken about Thornfield Hall normally. I mean, uh, I, I actually wanted some people to ask me this question instead of me talking about it. Thornfield Hall is again a classic house which is built on money from the uh, Caribbeans. All right. And of course, in a later redoing of this novel, I think White Sargasso say, there is a greater emphasis on the plantation house 
okay, in Kulibri. And so uh, Thornfield Hall has been much spoken about. Yes, I mean, it is also a house that is built on the money of, uh, of the mad woman in the attic. And I think in the Victorian period, there is a deepening of these sensibilities. You said that there's a deepening of an awareness of the sin of slavery, the burden of slavery. And, uh, and it is that which casts its long shadow upon Thornfield Hall. The name itself is see far less celebratory than Mansfield Park. Okay, Mansfield Park contains within it a sense of celebration because it refers to that great anti-slavery uh, judgment by Lord Mansfield. Whereas Thornfield, uh, you know, refers to some of the thorns that the British colonizers have actually sown and they are going to reap the whirlwind. And it is only in the ethical fitness of things that Thornfield Hall is burnt down. And when uh, uh, Jane Eyre says, reader, I married him, obviously they are not going to live in Thornfield Hall anymore. There is, uh, they, uh, it's a paradise lost, but it's also a paradise regained in the sense that the burning down of Thornfield Hall in a way uh, sort of, you know, sort of squares up the sin of enslaving people and instrumentalizing them and, you know, packing a woman, uh, a mad woman in the attic. So the burning down of Thornfield Hall, I would say, is ethically uh, important, ethically viable. Uh, thank you so much, Madam. I cannot thank you enough on behalf of the department for uh, your scholarly talk and also for your words of uh, encouragement in respect of our hosting this web lecture series. Now over to my uh, student Modurima. Modurima, are you there? Ma'am, stay with us for one more minute. Yes, are you I, there? I, just, just one thing, uh, you know, Ayon, <laughs> I would like to repeat this at the end of my lecture that a lecture in this webinar format, which many people are criticizing, is something that is like a communion because you cannot see the teacher. I mean, literally, I mean, of course, you can see the teacher on the webcam. It enhances the idea of what Martin Buber would call a communion. So this, you know, this uh, connection between us and you and this loneliness that we suffer during the contagion is something that has been bridged by this department and I'm very, very beholden for, uh, you know, enacting this communion as it were. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Madhurima, over to you. Madhurima? Yes. Now, may I request, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Th uh, thank you. Now, may I kindly request most Mekundu ma'am, faculty, student of English, but call it. Thanks, ma'am. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Okay. I feel privileged enough to propose on behalf of the Department of English Buffalo Christian College our indebtedness to the two distinguished resource persons today. They are Dr. Sise Kuba Chatterjee, Associate Professor of PG Department of English, Hukli Mohusin College, and Professor Nondini Bhattacharya, Professor of English and Culture Studies, the University of Badwan, who have been kind enough to spare their valuable time for today's lecture despite their hectic schedule. On behalf of all the participants, I acknowledge with sincere gratitude and thankfulness some new perspectives in studies and further researches that they have opened up for us through their insightful and extremely engaging lecture. Thank you, sir, Dr. Chatterjee, and thank you, ma'am, and Professor Bhattacharya. I humbly, I humbly acknowledge the participation of huge number of faculty members 
of different institutions, students, and researchers of Google Meet and YouTube Live. They have been patient enough to listen to the lectures with rapt attention and inclusive enough to interact with our Rivia resource persons. We will meet again tomorrow at 11 a.m. with two eminent speakers, Dr. Choipat Sarkar from Midnapur College and Dr. Pinaki De from R.T. Mohan College. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. And thank, thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm, 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 uh, uh, you know, closing this now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay.